They are both in English. Um, I thought that, honestly, that was kind of important because we're talking about two English ladies in particular. Um, they both came in different ways. Uh, when I first sat down and it felt like we were actually going to make this movie, um, I was not familiar with a great deal of English actresses. And someone put a performance by Imogen in front of me. And honestly, part of the search was over at that. She is amazing. She is compelling. She is thoughtful. She is energetic. And I was just, once I sat down with her, I thought she'd be a joy to work with. Haley, on the other hand, Believe it or not, she was getting ready to be in a uh, large tentpole movie, and she had read the script, and she came after me. And at first, I thought it was one of those things that your agents just kind of sit you down with people so that you feel like they're doing something for your career. But Haley really enjoyed the script, the process, the thought that went behind it, and she was very excited about being in it. And again, she had a particular energy about her beyond just her skill that really made me want to, to work with her. Um, but both of the ladies, Beyond the performances that you see or that you've seen with them in the past, I think one of the things that was very important to us in terms of making the film was really developing a chemistry. Uh, this film is about relationships, it's about characters, it's about connectivity. And I can't say enough about all three of the actors, Andre, Imogen, and Haley. Uh, early in my career, I was very fortunate I got to work with Francis Ford Coppola. And one of the things he said is like, look, you can write a great script, you can storyboard, you can shot list, you can do all of those things. But what really makes a film are those moments that the actors spend together over a bottle of wine. So building that chemistry, that's something you can't make, you can't fake. Uh, that's something that they all put into it. And I really got the sense in sitting down with them individually that they were individuals who would like to spend time with each other and really excavate these characters as characters, and not caricatures. Um, I, well, I guess my opinion, I'm, I'm a fan of biopics. And I think uh, what kind of separates this one is, I know we see a lot of biopics and it's um, like a telling of, of kind of images and, you know, already like things that we've seen that we know of an artist and we just try to see if they can pull them off. I think uh, what's important about this one is we've got to see more of the person, the human side of Hendrix, which is really important in a lot of artists' life. And because I'm an entertainer myself, I know how important that is. And, people around you, the people that support you, the people that nurture you, and I think um, Hendrix definitely wouldn't be Hendrix if it weren't for the people around him. And I think uh, we get to see, that's what this movie is about, so I think we get to see that. Yeah. Angela? Oh, sorry. I would say very I would agree with Andre, I've been looking for a, a film to be relevant, it's got to be informative, and the opportunity to not just chase things that people have seen. I mean, look, there are great performances that are out there, whether it's Monterey, whether it's Woodstock, they're similar, but the reality is you're chasing one of the greats of all time. So I think we got to a point in putting this together, we said, look, we can do something that is, you can see on DVD or has been represented in other films, and quite frankly, it's been represented in commercials, mm -hmm. selling cars, and we could be, you know, done it 44 times, we could do it for the 45th and hope maybe we get it right, or we could give life to moments like Jimmy and Eric Clapton at the Polytechnic or the Savo Theater performance that some people may know about, but none of us will ever get the opportunity to see. So I think that even elevated the game because we were able to do something that was a little bit liberating, but there was a sense if we are going to do it, we've really got to be honorific to the spirit of what was going on at that time. I think it connects a little bit more, too, because uh, you know we see these stars on stage. and I mean, that's the business of making people into stars, making them bigger than life. But I think uh, what resonates with the human is seeing the human side of another human, knowing that Hendrix was nervous, knowing that he didn't like his voice, knowing that it actually took a minute for him to get comfortable. Like, there's actually footage on YouTube, his first performances in Paris, it's black and white footage, and, you know, he's rolling around on stage, but it's not as cool as it looks, you know, at Monterey, so it took him a minute to learn and get the confidence. So I think uh, as human, as humans, we like to see yeah, well, he's, he's just like me, you know? I mean, we put him up here, but he had to get, get there first. Yeah, well, I think what I'm was waiting that for like? that. <laughs> 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 it may be today. It may be today. Uh, yeah. I think Andre's experience is probably different than mine, but... Yeah, I think it, once again, like this answer will, will speak to the film once again. It's, it's like when you're in it and when approaching the Jimmy role, 
it's kind of like what is the human side of it because I know from being an entertainer for 20 years I know how people approach me I know what people write about me I know when people see me on the street what they say and they put you up here but the whole time I just know I'm a kid doing this music that I love doing and I don't, I'm not thinking this is just how people perceive you you know so it's like I can't say what that date is mm. you know I can't look back now and say whoa that was a few great years because it's 20 years later but when you're in it you don't know really what's going on, so I can't really pinpoint a date. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, I've been very, very, very blessed over the last couple of years, and that anything that has become apparent to me is that the blessings that I have have a whole lot more to do with people not named John Ridley than John Ridley. And the thing that resonated for me, we certainly think of Hendrix and his artistry and his greatness, but, you know, 24 years old, he wasn't sure where he should go or what he should do, he played with, I can see, you know, the Isley Brothers, Little Richard, had never fit in. And yet there was a core group of individuals, Linda, Chaz, Kathy, Noel, Mitch, who all saw something in him that sometimes, you know, we don't see in ourselves. And for me, that was the big deal in this film. It's not just to take a year and say, well, this year was transformative because he became famous, because other people outside audiences discovered that, but those few key people um, this is wine in the film I really love. The things that you love, they stay with you whether you want them to or not. Um, I think those relationships that I really wanted to try to ex excavate have been telling the story. I, can I, may I just say one thing? I, Andre's a very humble man. Andre, uh, he really he put everything into this. He really, really did. And, you know, as I said, I'm very fortunate right now. I think as Andre was talking about perceptions, people perceive me maybe differently than I deserve to be. But, you know, two and a half years ago, three years ago when we met, I, I didn't have 12 years of slave, I didn't have an Oscar, I think I had an undercover brother, which maybe you may have seen <laughs> or not. I like it, that was good. Um, to talk to someone of Andre's, not just his stature, but someone of his nature, someone who uh, cares about music, cares about history, has a very deep anthropological approach to many, many things in life, and say, look, I don't have money, I don't have a contract, um, I don't have other actors, I don't have anything except my passion, a particular story that most people aren't aware of, a way into this that is about individuals rather than just iconography. Um, but for me to try to do this, I need a partner who I think, like me, doesn't want to just do a Vegas Lounge Act impression of it. Uh, Andre spent about, all together, about seven and a half months, uh, met him in Atlanta, moved out here to Los Angeles, worked on everything, vocal, uh, worked on uh, watching film, not just of Hendrix, but of the type of films that I wanted to try to express, the language of cinema. I think that was very important to have a partner who understands the language that you're speaking. Um, Andre's in great shape, went on the diet, uh, really got himself down to Jimmy's shape. Uh, we went to Dublin, he worked with the actresses for over a month over there, then there was a shooting and all of that. So I don't know, you know, if you ask him directly, he's a wonderful individual, I don't know he would talk about everything that he put into it, but I will say this, I really believe there are any number of terrific actors out there who in the past or in the future could do a wonderful job portraying Jimi Hendrix, but I don't know there are a lot of people who would put all of themselves into this and take out of it so much of this individual, um, honorific of the person, of the relationships, and all that. It wasn't easy, and for someone, if nothing else, to go on a diet like that, where I think you're eating an egg in the afternoon um, no, I wouldn't have been. <laughs> <laughs> but do it also with um, a wonderful, just a wonderful nature all the way through and leadership on the set. Um, it was a pleasure. It really, really was. I think, um, I think you should you should start because John actually came to me about it. I, I've been approached when I was younger about it, but um, I think at that time I was just a young guy excited about your moves. I had no. I actually didn't know at the time that I had been approached before, and I felt sort of dumb after that because of, you know you, you feel like. You just go into a guy because he, he may be the obvious choice. Um, as I said, there were things that I learned about Andre that made him, at least in my opinion, kindred spirit to it. But for me, I mean, look, I think the reason the vast majority of us even here is because at some point we can say that we are Hendrix fan in some regard for the music, for what he represented, for his post-racial post -racial nature that he brought to music. But honestly, it started with me for uh, with a Hendrix rarity that I heard one night. Uh, it was a song that had a, a drive and an emotion and a feeling that even for Hendrix music was something that I had not felt before. And the title of the song was Sending My Love to Linda. Mm -hmm. And just started 
be searching more and looking more and, and talking to people and did some pieces for NPR about that song and that air. And as I said before, there was just so much information in there that was relevant in a way that I was unfamiliar with. And I really felt that if there was a way to tell the story that people could feel the emotion that I felt when I was hearing that song, then it would be worthwhile. I felt like I wasn't just recycling things that people knew about or putting things up because you could, but really trying to bring up an emotion that was real in particular, at least for me, even if it was a slightly romanticized version of it. And I'd never heard the song before until John pointed it out to me, and I'm a huge Henry fan, so I was kind of geeked about it. Uh, for for me, it was in a, it was in a film. Um, as a young guy, I didn't know about Hendrix. I was all into rap and sports, so you know I discovered Hendrix like maybe in my early twenties. But I think I was watching a war film. I don't know if it was Platoon, Full Metal Jacket, or uh, Apocalypse Now. But there was a helicopter scene, and all along the Watchtower was playing, and that was the first time I'd ever heard a Hendrix song, and it was like these crazy solos. And from that point on, I was just a Hendrix fan. And once I picked up the guitar myself, you know, I wanted to know other African Americans that were playing. And of course, Jimmy came across. And it's funny, as a kid, you just knew Jimmy as this wild black man that nobody understood. That's all you really knew. You, I, you didn't know his music, really. You just knew of this image of the dude. I just, I would say my first Sorry. experience was actually uh, a book that I got out of the library. and. In retrospect, I think it was just interesting because my exposure was more um, knowledge-based and word-based and kind of deep. And later, I started hearing his music, and I really couldn't... I mean, it was far more mature than I was the first times that I heard it. Uh, but later, when the reissues on D, uh, CD started coming out, and I heard... Um, I think the first album my mom got me was one of these bad, unauthorized greatest hits collection and you know the songs were all fine it was all there but it was just you know this level of maturity that I wasn't quite commiserate with but later when the reissues came out I heard Axis Bold is Love just as an album in its entirety and it started reading Electric Gypsy and kind of with more of the person with the music and the history it was just a confluence of thought and sound that really sent me in another direction but it was probably a little bit backwards than most people have this real, you know, I hear the music, I have an amazing emotional response. To me, it was these stories about these individuals, and then later, getting myself to a level where I could actually appreciate the depth of the music. I know, to, uh, man, to be honest, I was, I was funny that you, that you, <laughs> funny that you say that, like, I'm a shit guitarist, man. Like, <laughs> I, honestly, I'm a right-hand right guitarist, but I'm a closet player, you know, I only play, like, I'm more punk guitarist than anything, so it's just, like, loud and fast, but, um, when we were preparing to make the movie, we thought that we could do it right-handed and then flip the image so I could look as comfortable as possible. But it would be way too expensive to shoot that way, so we had to decide to go you know, with the left-handed gig, and I was really not confident in it at all. And I remember having a conversation on the phone, I think a couple of days before we left to go to it Ireland. Was, it was about two days before we were going to start yeah. shooting. I was like, man, I'm not sure if I can do this or whatever. And but to me, the funny thing was that he'd worked for Artie for months, and he'd rehearsed it left-handed, and I'd actually had video of him shooting it left-handed, so I had this high degree of confidence. And I think a lot of that goes back to if Andre was going to do it, you know, you have to be one of the best guitarists in the world to pick it out. That was his desire all the way through. But I will just say, in, in doing it, what we did early on, we had Andrew Rollins, who was Andre's guitar coach, who's phenomenal in his own right, and we just picked sections of the song. We kind of storyboarded early about, okay, this is the first time we see it, so we're going to take this section and that section and not try to emulate it over the entire song and really break it down and do these parts. And as you say, it was just repetition, 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 and then getting the part where Andre could take his own um, charisma as a performer and someone who's been on stage his entire life and put it into it. It was one of those things that we went back and forth and rightly so in that 11th hour it was like hey is this because once we went down that road we were we were committed right. um, it was about the framing about flipping the frames about CGI there are other films I know where they've done for example with piano and you CGI it in that's a, we don't we didn't have that kind of money um, I really believe that in the end uh, doing it live and this not just about this there are other projects I'm working on where there's just if you do it that way everybody everybody everybody's forced to do it right the first time and I'd say, okay, we'll get it later in post. Um, but in the end, it, 
you know, it was Andre's call and he made the call and he did it. I mean, that's, there's just no two ways about it. And uh, just uh, to say another thing about the left hand thing, um, Jimmy, when you, and I think any guitarist would agree, Jimmy is probably the most comfortable looking guitarist in the world. Like most guitars, even if they're great, they look like they're doing a task, like it's, they're working, you know, but Jimmy never looked like he was working. You know, I always looked like it was like his extra hand. So, you know, I guess the, the confidence that I didn't have in doing it left-handed was, okay, I'm actually doing something that I'm not, my motor skills are not used to doing, and I have to look like I've been doing it all my life, and I have to look like Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, I just, the confidence was just gone. And you know, I mean, left-handed anything is just horrible. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, I don't mean to be vulgar, but it's like if you masturbate with your right hand all your life and then you have to switch it up, it's like, it's, it's just not. Try it when you get home. It's, it's, it's totally opposite. It's like, it just throws you off. So it, John, John, he gave me, he said, well, the way we will shoot it, you will be okay. So I, was, okay. I say about the project is that I asked Andre to do just two things. He had to turn water into wine and he had to do it with his left hand. And if he could do that, we would have a film. Yeah, and no he somehow <laughs> actually pull it off. Yeah. It's two things, actually. Uh, Hendrix's confidence in his playing, and um, he was pretty ballsy. Like, I've heard interviews where he was kind of shit talking, you know, uh, about other players. I mean, not putting them down, but basically talking about his skill. And also just um, his remorse. There was an interview where, of course, you'll see it in, in the film where Hendrix. Um, you know, he, he has to go on stage and play with Clapton. Later on, there's an interview where Hendrix says, oh man, I hate that that actually happened. You know, because he said, I love Clapton and I really love his playing and I would love to play with Clapton every day. He said, but it knew, I knew at that point it came down to a me or him. And I, I knew walking to the stage, I would have to burn him to make it. And so in the interview, he's like, oh, I feel so bad about it. Mm -hmm but I had to do it. <laughs> so, you know, you get to see that he's, he's human too. He's like, oh man, I didn't want to do that. Yeah. And there's another great thing. I think kids should, uh, should uh, hear this one too. Um, Hendrix, everybody knows, especially young people, they know him as this drug addict kind of guy. But there's an interview where Hendrix says, I know now, he said, I used to think that I was built to take all these drugs, that I was made to do this. And he said, I know now that I've taken entirely too many drugs. And he said it, he said it so, um, I don't know. You know, it's just another side of somebody that you think is just high all the time and don't give a fuck. You know, uh, it was the greatest, and I think uh, we spoke to this earlier. I think the best directed decision was to put that time in before we actually start shooting because we actually got to spend time and go on basically like dates and chill out moments. So I get to, I got to know these women. It was actually the best job in the world. You kind of <laughs> go out with these two women and they're fine with it. You know. It's cool. <laughs> But uh, yeah, we had dinners, um, breakfasts, uh, lunch. Uh, we just kind of kicked it around the city. And uh, I think that was really important to the film because I got to know them and they were cool, cool, really cool individuals. So it wasn't just like, I'm showing up day one and you're yelling action and I have to really act like I know, you know these women and there's that certain nervousness. Of course, there was a slight nervousness because they were actors to me and I didn't consider myself an actor. So. You know, just spending that time, they got me more comfortable with being around a true actor. And I learned from them, you know, pointers. So I think it, it helped in both ways. It was it was scary, you know, and I, people ask me about, like, what is it like trying to find that, the, the essence of Hendrix? And I don't know if I actually nailed it. I just knew John said, whatever you do, just own it. So I think, I mean, we have to be honest. I mean, we're we're doing trickery here. It's not, I, I will never be Hendrix. You know, and I think John said that earlier, you'll never be Hendrix, but tell me, like, your interpretation of it don't give me you know this kind of um, this kind of sideshow kind of thing you know just give me your Hendrix and give me the best one that you can do so I just tried my best I can't say that I'm on a level with Hendrix I can't say that I'm spiritually connected to him or any, any of that kind of stuff I just read as much as I could read do as much research as possible and yeah there's certain you know crossing points in our careers that I feel like you know I would agree on certain things, I know what it's like to be a nervous artist. You know, I know what it's like to grow as an artist. I know what it's like to want full freedom in what you're doing. I know what it's like to uh, want to fully throw yourself into music. I know what it's like to want to look cool while you're doing it. So, um, I mean, there are, you know, points that we can agree on, but I don't know him in that way. I know him as much as y'all know him.
you know, I just read a little, probably a little bit more than you did to, to get into the role. It's just surprising that during that time, and I think we have to, the time is really important. You know, during that time, you gotta think now, you know, you may see a black man and a white woman walking down the street and it's not as bad, but you have to remember that these were times when they were checking into hotels as the experience. And they didn't want him there with the rest of his band. So, you know, I just learned he had, uh, he had to calm himself and still himself in a way. I think just that humility, you know, you learn that, you know, just focusing on what's important. And to me, it was, all, it was about the music for him. So, I mean, he didn't get into a lot of riffs, you know, in that way. I just, I guess learned that humility from him. Uh, it, was, it was a process. I think you start off and um, kind of like a, a, start off mimicking because you're, you're, you're mimicking, you're, you're listening to tape, you're watching his movements, um, you're watching some of the slang that he may use. So it starts off as a mimic, but the more you do it, the more you do it, it kind of becomes a part of you. And I think one of the best things that uh, as director John did was have me stay in it. Sometimes when we weren't even on, you know, on set, uh, we were just being a normal day, probably going through scenes and, or just, you know, hanging around. He wanted to hear, hear Hendrix. And I think that helped the naturalness of it. I think the more you do it, the more it kind of just starts to bleed into your own self and then you find this, this meeting point. So I think that once you connect to your real self and then this mimic meeting point, hopefully uh, at that point, you know, we, we give this portrayal that, that you all can uh, believe in. So it, it's really just a repetition and time, just staying in it. I, you know, I'll say with that, Incident and you know the Carmen Barrero story that's out there with the wine bottle and things like that. Um, you know, obviously we're not the originators of it. I think the big thing for us was also not to obsess on it. Um, one of the things I learned very early on about this story, and I had the opportunity uh, to talk to Linda Keith, and she said, "Look, one of the reasons I don't want to talk about this a lot is because it's always the cliches of sex, drug, and rock and roll." Um, you know, I mean, look, uh, we're particularly going through a time right now where, unfortunately, we're seeing people that we look up to who are doing things that are. Uh, reprehensible um, and the tolerance for that has certainly changed a lot but the reality is I think for most of us is that we are people and that we're complex and we do things that hurt people in big ways and small ways um, what I don't think and I'll just speak for myself as the writer one thing I never wanted to do is however do something that was uh, an official story and do something that was just propaganda because I think we've seen that we've seen those versions of it just as people we don't quite connect with it um, he's a complicated person. A lot of people are complicated. There are people out there, whether they're uh, athletes or politicians or business people who do things that just sort of boggle the mind, uh, but it is also part of who they are. Um, I think just in terms of the fundamental aspect of shooting it, um, emotionally, I don't think it was difficult because we just did a, we had worked in that space so long we knew that we were going places all over where people who were maybe not, were not familiar with all of Jimmy's story um, would be surprised, but more than anything for me, I also wanted to uh, tell a story where the in beats were not typical in rock and roll, where you're looking at your watch waiting for the tragic end. Mm -hmm. um, one of the last lines in this film is Andre is Jimmy talking about inspiring people and being inspired constantly. Um, the fact of the matter is, when this story ends, there were three of the most amazing years of music to come. And if people walk out of this knowing that you have someone who is also a gentle soul, someone who says things like when the power of love takes over the love of power, that's when you'll change. When someone who sits down with someone else in his own race, who puts expectations on him about being this or that, or playing to your people, and Jimmy says to him, hey, they're all my people. Those are also the aspects that we really want to get out there, and for a lot of people, they don't know that about Jimmy. They don't know the depth of his character, they don't know the complexity of his ethnocentric aspects, uh, they don't know his gentleness. Uh, again, another line, the things that you love stay with you whether you want them to or not. Uh, those things are really, really beautiful. So, uh, you know, it's hard for anyone that you look up to to find out that they were not 100% um, saint. And there is an aspect where, as Andre said earlier, this is a rock and roll god and deserves to be for all the things he did. But he's also a person. And it was always our intent to approach him as a person and tell a story about a human being. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm not, to be honest with you, I'm not hitting back at anybody over any circumstances. Uh, she was there and has every right to uh, recall things as she desires to recall them. The fact of the matter is, when you look at this, when you look at Lincoln, when you look at Zero Dark Thirty, I mean, nobody has impaneled a Senate commission yet to look at this film. So there's a level of, with these kinds of films, 
you know, historians don't agree on history, so there is a level of, there were many people there and recall things in different ways, and when you put this history of an individual who honestly has become legendary, I have absolutely no doubt that folks are going to say, oh yeah, but it was like this or it was like that, as is their right. So I'm not getting in a shouting match with, with the press with anybody, and you know, these stories are out there. Again, that one, the Carmen Barrero story, even, one does not have to be a great detective to actually find out where some of these stories originated from. And I would just say this, not about anyone in particular, if you actually look at where some of these stories originated from, you might actually be surprised about who's saying what about what. That's all I'm saying. Still, I feel like I'm a very lucky man, is what, is what it is. Um, you know, I don't do a lot of work, so you know, when John approached, uh, there was a little uh, hesitance to do it. Um, I'm more of an idealist if I feel like it's something that I can believe in, you know, as a whole, and I think the outcome will be great. I'll put my all into it, and to be honest, I don't necessarily think you have to be an actor to act. You know, you don't have to be a musician to make great music. So, you know, if it comes along and you put your all into it, it's just the outcome is what's important. So, no, I still don't consider myself an actor. I don't go to classes and that kind of thing. Um, but if I have a project that I'm interested in and I need to go to classes, I will. So, he's talking about Danny Bramson, who's one of our producers and uh, was basically our archivist, our front man, our, our agent, our intermediary in terms of going to music. One of the reasons Danny Bramson was the guy to go to was Danny, I think when he was about 16 or 18, started the Universal Amphitheater, which unfortunately we just lost here in Los Angeles. This is a 16-year-old kid saying, hey, you know what? You got this space back here that you're not doing anything with your stunt shows afterwards. Why don't we start putting music in here? Um, this is a guy who is uh, a, an intimate with probably every luminary in rock music. Um, you know, you can just go on and on and list the names. Uh, someone who knows these individuals, someone who cares about music, cares about getting it right, because he may be sitting down with these folks at one time or another. Um, someone who has access to individuals like Sir Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. So when you say you want to excavate an amazing performance that most people have never seen, um, that really is one of the seminal moments in music history. These are individuals who will look at it and take you seriously and say, yeah, we think you're gonna do it right and we think you're gonna do it in an honorific way. Please be involved in that. There were little things that Danny, when we first sat down and talked about the script, we talked about uh, back in London in the day, you know, it was so cold, uh, a lot of the rehearsal spaces would have these little heaters in it, but you had to, they were coin operated, and you had to put yeah. coins in it, and you know, mm -hmm. artists back in the day didn't have a lot of money, so they were all bundled up and cold, and just little grace notes, and that's the great phrase you would always use, was grace notes, that even if the audience doesn't literally see it, when you're sitting down and talking through a scene, that they mattered. Um, this is a guy who could go to somebody like Wadi Wachtel, who's been around music and played with everybody, and when we needed somebody who could put down the music and do it with heart and emotion and feeling as well as a technical aspect could actually get those people interested in your project. So in every regard, you know, Danny was that guy. He had that history, he had that understanding, he had that bridge that for someone like me who, you know, does not know those folks. And again, you know, the, the me before and the me after these last couple of years, there may be other access I could get, but to have someone like that who could look at the words on the page and look at the story that you want to tell and say, yeah, there is value here and the approach you guys are taking, it is one that I could look at these folks like Eric Clapton that he knows and say that, yeah, these guys are doing it because they care, not because they can. That makes a difference. Well, it can be a major thing. Like any obstacle, it's what you make of it or what you allow it to make of you. Um, there are folks like Paul Greengrass of the Hughes Brothers who in the past wanted to make a film like this and, I mean, look, their resumes are deeper, richer, better than, quite frankly, mine may ever be, and they were not able to find a way to bridge that divide between what they wanted to do and what the owners of the IP wish to accomplish. So there comes a point when just realistically, if folks <coughs> like that can't do it, you've got to know that there's going to be challenges for you. But at the same time, as I started to learn more about this particular story, I always believed that there was emotional velocity to it that wouldn't be dependent on particular artifacts. And as I believe I said before, We've seen movies where folks have every artifact in the world, but it just doesn't connect with the audience. It's got to be about character, it's got to be about charisma, it's got to be about chemistry. Uh, it's got to be about those fundamentals of storytelling. So, honestly, there was music that was out there that was real, that was true, that Hendrix played, that we had access to, like Manish Boy, like Killin' Floor, uh, like Sgt. Pepper. 
Uh, there were individuals like Bob Dylan who saw what we were doing and said, yeah, we have no problem signing off on it. So it's a balancing act. Uh, as with anything <laughs> that you go into, you can't please everybody, you can't reach everybody, you can't convince everybody. But I never, ever believed that that alone was going to be an impediment to it and uh, to what I was hoping to accomplish with the partners that I had. The example that I would use is Sid and Nancy. Um, I'm not a big punk rock fan. I don't particularly want to hang out with druggies all the time. But what Alex Cox did with that film, what he did with Connectivity, what uh, Gary Oldman and Chloe Webb were able to do with their performances, and the language of cinema they did to me transcended what the fundamental aspects of that film were meant to be about and got to the heart of the matter, which was the heart of the individuals. Great. Tell them, John. <laughs>